Is it under your three dots where there are more, more actions it shows on mine? Yeah, I've, I've just clicked it. So um, recording and transcription has now started. Uh, so there we go, we're, we're recording. Right, so many thanks everybody for popping along. Um, so first I just want to briefly introduce uh, Paul Gibbs. So I've, I've worked with Paul on and off for a number of years uh, and uh, I really like his stuff because often it's um, you know, really kind of unusual and obscure, uh, the kind of things that I'm particularly interested in. Uh, but Paul is Emeritus Professor of Middlesex University, founder of the Centre for Education Research and Scholarship. Uh, he's also visiting prof at the University of Technology, Sydney and Azerbaijan and East European Universities, a fellow of Atlas, Texas University and a Centre of Higher Education Policy, New College, Oxford. Um, so Paul has taught on notions of trans transit disciplinarity uh, alongside social realism and Heideggerian hermeneutics, which will interest Dave uh, no end, uh, and has over 30 successful transdisciplinary professional doctorate students. Uh, he's published over 20 peer reviewed books and published more than 100 academic articles and chapters. Um, so tonight, Paul's beginning is, is, is kind of going to deliver an experimental paper um, on, on some of the concepts associated with Nicolescu and uh, Dun Scotus. Uh, so I am particularly interested in the Dun Scotus stuff and I'm going to learn something new, no doubt, on the, the Nicolescu. Um, so that's that's kind of introduction. So I'm going to pass over to you now, Paul, to, to take it away. Well, that's very kind. Thanks, Craig. And thank everybody for turning up. Um, I won't have any objections if you decide that this probably isn't for you. Um, but I would welcome any comments that you want to make during the, the discussion and particularly at the end. As Craig says, this is a project that I'm looking at trying to bring together um, insights into a transdisciplinary attitude, really. And it's about, I mean, I get very irritated about the, the clumsiness with which transdisciplinarity as a term is used. Now, it doesn't mean that what how I define it is necessarily correct, but it does in, in a, a large number of uh, pieces of literature get conflated with interdisciplinary uh, and multidisciplinary. And I take it, if you like, a kind of idea which it could be as a kind of metaphysical catalyst as a way of using um, transdisciplinarity as a way of revealing truths about being. Now, this isn't intended to be uh, a philosophical lecture uh, because I'm not a philosopher, but the idea is that it seems to me, and I'll refer a couple of times to uh, Tolstoy, about the notion that if we don't understand what we're trying to do as educationalists, what's the point of starting? And so it seems to me that a better understanding of being gives us an opportunity to be able to position where we want to take our teaching and why we're doing it. And for me, transdisciplinarity has a wider uh, connotation than blending disciplines. And a way to make that um, wider connotation more transparent I think has been through the work of Dun Scottis. So that's a kind of background. My next slides, I'll linger a little on um, some of the terms. I won't linger too long, I hope, um, but if there are things that I'm going to introduce here that you're not aware of and want to be, then just shout and we can stop there and then and um, open up and discuss those bits as we move on. So the first thing that I wanted to talk about is that the paper considers how we might understand Nicolescu's transdisciplinary approach. So if you're not 100% coherent with transdisciplinarity, it falls into two kind of groups. There's the uh, Sw Swiss group who talk about transdisciplinarity as if it's interdisciplinary and use um, uh, an epistemology driven through disciplines. 
And then there's Nicolescu, who tries to take a more spiritual, more holistic approach, that transdisciplinarity is a way of being, and it's a different, leads to a different ontological or ontoepistemological uh, practice. I'm in the Nicolescu group because I've gone to a, had a drink with Nicolescu. I haven't had a drink with the guys from um, Switzerland, uh, although I've met them. So that's my deep academic justification <laughs> for supporting Nicolescu. Uh, so Nicolescu has uh, three basic axioms, which he talks are critical for the um, um, transdisciplinary approach. And they are multi-levels of uh, reality, the hidden third, and the included middle. All of these are fairly um, interesting. Uh, but if I, as I put on this slide, explain it a bit more, the hidden third is the kind of soul. It's the way in which the, our universal being as humanity gives us the energy for it to be manifested in our personhood. OK, so there's something about all of us and we'll talk about that um, a little later but what makes you and me different is the way in which the soul is manifested in uh, our personhood and the logic of the included middle is basically saying that there is instead of being only two forms of existence non-existence and existence there's a third form which is neither existing or non-existing a really good example of that is when if you take a cylinder yeah and and put it and 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 focus a light upon the cylinder the cylinder in two different directions in one case it's a um circle in another case it's an oblong so what nicolescu is arguing is that there are different states of being that exist at the same time now nicolescu was a, um, and it still plays with um, nuclear physics and quantum physics. Yeah. So most of this stuff that he talks about, particularly with regard to reality and, for, and levels of reality, comes from um, physicists like Hartman and Heisenberg. So those kind of, I think, inhibit the way in which transdisciplinarity can in of itself move forward. So I don't think he has a metaphysical under, a metaphysical position on this. And so to get there, I've kind of inframed um, Don Scottis. Um, and I just like, I'll show you a picture of him in a moment. I like his hat. So that's why we work with Don Scottis. And his hat is the... Um, archetypical reason why Don Scottis is associated with dunces in class. So Don Scottis leads to the notion of dunces. Anyway, I don't take, by the way, when I'm using Don Scottis and I use Scottism's notion of scalacticism, I don't use um, a religious connotation. So I argue that scholasticism is a method philosophical methodology which can be used separate from a religious um, and theological premise behind it. That's contestable. Um, and what I read about these issues is um, it comes down either side. So, but the notions that Scondotis um, uh, has, what I want to use, is university, which for me is a really radical route for a theologian because. What that does is underpin the position of th the theologians. It actually says you don't need them to interpret God's word. And so that when we talk about the world, the discourse that we use and the words that we use mean the same for the imminent and the transcendental. And so it allows a blending of those two notions in the way in which we see the world. Then there is the syncretic, uh, uh, synchronic uh, contingency, and that's very much like um, 
uh, the idea that two things can exist at any time. The reason that's important is that it takes away the notion of determinism. You know, we can either be happy or we're unhappy, but a divine being doesn't make us happy or unhappy. The circumstances are reflected on our dispositions. And our dispositions for me, I would call and discuss later in terms of causal powers. Now, causal powers have come back into a philosophical um, potency as a reaction against the deterministic notions of um, scientism. Now, all of these, I'm sure you're thinking at the moment, well, this could reply to our managerialism of the universities at the moment. They can all do with the, the forces of um, uh, uh, using metrics as a way of measuring. All of these things are relevant to the way in which I would see the world through a transdisciplinary stroke Dun Scottish approach. So it's about a world, our world view. What Dun Scottish does do, and probably is most famed for, is talking about the thingness of a thing. And that famous um, um, work by uh, Heidegger on what is a thing is quite clearly embedded in the work that Heidegger had done on Don Scotus and on uh, Aristotle. And the final thing there is the uh, formal distinction which so we're talking about the formal distinction and that distincts between concept and reality. So we can say that there is such a thing as humanity, which is a concept. But then when I talk about Craig, we're talking about an individual. And so somehow, as we work through um, some of the philosophers that I want to talk about, that distinction between the general and the Pacific is important. Now, I've written about because I got quite angry about managers who talk about the student voice. And they don't mean the student voice at all. And if they did, they mean that there's one voice for the student. Well, that's an impossibility as far as I can see. So that what you've got is the universal voice of the student, which is the concept. And then you have the individual voice of the student, which is a reality. And as I see that implied, the formal distinction applied in education, it's like saying that what we want is on an engineering course, I'm really getting out of my comfort zone here. In a engineering course, we want mechanical engineers. Or if we're, if we're doing medicine, we want physicians, all of which know roughly where the arms and legs are. But we also need to have Jane as a physician. So Jane has to emerge. So emergence is part of the stuff that we're talking about from the universality of uh, physicians. So that is much more difficult to square. And it's something I believe that in our teaching practice, somehow we have to achieve that. And it's much more nuanced than student centered learning. Because Again, we, we end up with talking about student centers learning when we're talking about student there as a collective noun, not as an individual. So all these things, if you can stick with me, have some potentially practical implication. And then, so what I'm trying to do is pattern together the metaphysics, a metaphysical basis of transdisciplinarity, uh, which isn't reliant on a scientific rationality. It seems to me that as soon as you if you don't go one step behind the epistemological issue, you never get away from it. And so I think some of the problems that transdisciplinarity has is that very thing. Interestingly, there's a world conference on I say interestingly, and that's pretty arrogant. I find it interesting um, is that there is a world conference on transdisciplinarity currently underway. And they're trying to bring together the different factions of transdisciplinarity into one kind of thing, which seems to me to be anti-transdisciplinarity because it's about who they're going to have in, who they're not going to be in it. Let's use management systems. They don't let 
in my terms, that organization emerge from the interfaces and engagement with individuals. So, so that's a, and but as I rightly say here, it, it's speculative. It might be rubbish. Um, I would really prefer you don't use those terms when you criticize it, but I'm happy to accept that it might be. Okay, so um, that's actually that was the line that my greatest critic, my wife, who is much more able than I, insisted that I put in. Okay, so this is where we are, and let's move to the second. Well, amongst the kind of I minute, mean, the more I work on this, the more I think that almost everything fits into it. Now, I understand that if you have a theory or that where everything can be explained by it, it actually explains nothing. So I'm hesitant about that. But the people I've got here that might be of interest um, and whose thought, thinking interplays in this are clearly Aristotle, because I want to talk about causal forces. I want to talk at some stage about the four forces he talks about, but in particularly the technological force of the reason for being, which I think we ignore. Um, and it is an important cause of how, why we teach, I think. Uh, so he's in the middle, as in everybody. Uh, then we've got uh, Spinoza. Well, no, Don Scott is with his hat on at the bottom. Then uh, whose work that I've just talked about. You have um, Spinoza, who I think, although he doesn't mention um, Don Scottis in his work, is a Scottist in the way in which he talks about um, the nature of form and substance and how that creates us. And on the left hand side, before we get to Deleuze, who claims that Dun Scottis is the greatest onto ontologist in, has ever lived, there's Pierce. And C.P. Pierce, C.S. Pierce seems to me to be an unusual person that uh, engaged in this kind of thinking and reflects directly on the formal distinction that um, Don Scottis creates and argues that that's a significant aspect of his pragmatism. So all of this stuff is messy uh, and it does cut across uh, different epochs. I understand the danger of trying to do that, but I don't think there's a danger if you look conceptually at what they're trying to say and not lift the its actuality into a different epoch. So when I, we particularly talk about scholasticism, I'm not I'm looking at its elements and recontextualizing them now. I'm not saying that we should go back to reading texts, uh, debating them, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and obviously I'm fully aware of the power issues that are associated with that. So that's just the way in which um, I argue that we can compare different epochal um, uh, notions of being. Now, Nikulescu, Bezarab, um, wrote the Manifesto for Transdisciplinarity, which is out of um, print. I think you can get them cheap or you can get it on the internet. Um, and it has a whole range of, it, it's more of a cosmology it's more about, I think he's written another book called Cosmodernity. And what it's all about is trying to take his three axioms and place them all over the place. Yeah. But the one that I think is most important is the transdisciplinary attitude. And it's that attitude that I will return to at the end of the lecture and or, or the discussion, which I hope it will be. Um, as a way of saying this is something that um, teachers, researchers could adopt in the way in which they they are their practice. OK, and so in the um, transdisciplinary attitude, he talks about rigor, openness and tolerance. I, I've lifted it from the book, so that's why I've spelled rigor inappropriately. So again, I'm amazed that I spotted that. Um, and that they're the fundamental um, uh, characteristics 
of a transdisciplinary attitude towards the world. And when we get to um, further on into this discussion, I'll show you how I think Dun Scottis helps us in realizing those. Um, Nicolescu's work is, I think he wants to be a, um, uh, a, a postmodernist or posthumanist, whatever the sense is, uh, because he doesn't really want to dig down too deeply and give you absolute um, examples of stuff. But he, he, his main work is, is in, he's well related to um, a Romanian orthodoxy. And so he does have in his work, I think, a very explicit um, spirituality in the way in which he's working. And if we looked about the hidden third, it's that spirituality, or in my sense, a trans, uh, transcendentalness that is relevant to the way in which we look at stuff and when we define stuff it's not simply a, a um, phenomenological imminent thing that we need to look at so if you have time to read that slide that kind of tells you where i'm trying to get at from um Bezarab. the other thing that's important is to look at um uh, reality. Now, some of you who are, who are um, uh, scholars of critical realism and uh, uh, Bash Bashka's work will kind of identify um, the notion that one of the criticism he makes, one of the criticisms that Nicolescu makes, is that science, for instance, tends, tends only, to see stuff in a reality, not a, a lifting of realities or a, a, a plethora of realities. I'm not, I don't support um, um, Bashka's utilization of a laminated list of, uh, of realities, because I think they are separate and that, the, and that there is a, in order to move from one reality to another, they, the conditions have to be for us to em emerge from one reality to another. So that's the kind of stuff that I think uh, Scott has written in a great book that I edited when he talks about what occurs, the outcomes cannot be generated as an additive pooling of stuff, which is interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary of knowledges as very distant concerned. It requires a whole integration, a genuine uh, transdisciplinarity. So that's where I'm trying to get to. And my, I see not realities as stepping stones, you know, John's ladder of realities, but I see it as a um, rhythm, a flux of realities, which merge together, um, which have, um, they are perceived as independent yet indeterminate, and they are realized and dependent on the location of the becoming being. So it's where you are in that space. One other thing is I've written a, a detailed paper on this. Um, and if anybody wants it as a draft, I haven't published it yet. Um, you can have it and it gives all the references and stuff like that. So, so we've got to a point, I hope, where we've considered transdisciplinarity. We've broadly and briefly discussed John's uh, Scottis. We've looked at the major players as I see them. And so that we're now going to move on to um, the first thing that I want to talk about is being you. And that's the difference between me and you. OK, and it's a, I also want to argue that it's a difference between me being me today and me tomorrow. I am quite concerned about the notion of identity, which has a fixed identity, which we can identify. It seems to me that the transdisciplinary person is always in flux. So it makes it much more difficult to engage with them as one of the same, but it, it, it kind of gives us that freedom to be, which being something isn't. So what we are is the being that we are, not um, 
a teacher or something else. I mean, that obviously has links with uh, the current debates on transgender and stuff like that. Um, so that's where I see we are. As you can see on this slide here, my um, uh, uh, linguistic skills don't allow me to readily read out these terms. But in essence, they're about the um, the being of your yourself, the being of being. The um, the Aristotelian notion of entelacha uh, is kind of balanced, I think, with the uh, Aventia, who is the gentleman um, who I'm attributing uh, istadad. I I hope I got close to that definition. But those two um, have uh, events is events here doesn't take Aristotle. He develops Aristotle. And indeed, that kind of line over the top to um, Don Scottis's notion of the individual is informed considerably by events uh, ontology based on um, uh, Aristotle. So the, the kind of link arches over the top. Then we move to, to Spinoza's notion that um, our purpose is to become who we are and that external constraints on our being resist that. So we need to resist other people making us who they want us to be. And that quite clearly has um, connotations with Heidegger's notion of authenticity. Um, and you have the assemblage, which is Deleuze's notion of it. So all of those are kind of arguing that there is a tetalogical basis, which is within us, and it's the purpose of why our potential can be realized and actualized. Now, that actualization of our potential is clearly uh, within a context and that context as external contexts on our potentiality. Well, I, another bone that I have about this is that none of those are saying you can be who you want to be. It's just not possible. Yeah, I never made the England football team and I wanted to be. Yeah, I tried as hard as I could, but I couldn't be. So there is an issue here that one, what one can be is constrained by one what one is. That doesn't mean that you should not utilize your capabilities and your um, dispositions as much as you can, but you need to be realistic about it. And that comes back to the final thing that I'm going to talk about a bit further down the line, which is, and I'll move much quicker now, uh, which is about the notion of imagination. What I'm arguing is that we need to have an imagination, but we don't have to be illusionary. Yeah. So uh, it's our imagination of what we might be able to be, not a uh, imaginary self. So it's not an imaginary self. In my imaginary self, I am playing for England still. But my imagination can lead me to being the best I can be. Uh, which is to buy a ticket or save up for a ticket and go. So that's the, the kind of thing. So the second one is that I borrow from Dun Scottis here when we're looking about who I am is my willing me. And that is um, a division between the, the will supersedes the intellect. And Dun Scottis argues here that the the will tells the intellect what to intellectualize. So the priority must be with the will. And the will is divided into two sections. There's a section which looks after my prudence and there's a section which looks after others. And the will's job is to balance those two things out. Yeah. Now, that seems to me to be a really helpful way of looking at emotional education. What it's actually saying is that our critical argument our, is that how do we make people under, develop themselves and understand what is best for themselves and for others? That's the first criteria. The second criteria is how do they best go about that? 
And so that seems to me to be turning on our head our intellectual education system that we have. And so that we have the effectio commodi and effectio is digesti, which is the, the two different forms of um, judgment. So to summarize that, we best understand with the world within the terrain of realities or plateaus. Uh, that's just to give you a reference to obviously transdisciplinarity and Deleuze. Uh, and that just transdisciplinary is a way of engaging with the university uh, of the multiple realities of the world and the actions are our responsibility. So I'm a big responsibility person in others. Um, so, and, and the last thing I wrote was about um, academic freedom. I think academic freedom is a strange notion that still exists. Because it seems to me that if we, if we work in neoliberal institutions, what's the point of having academic freedom? If we don't work in neoliberalism, uh, neoliberal organizations, or we resist them, then there's a great reason to have the extra, extra privileges of uh, academic freedom. And if we do resist the pressures of neoliberalism, then the privileges that we're given through um, academic freedom require us to behave responsibly. So that's uh, another use of what I'm talking about. Rigor, openness and uh, tolerance. Rigor really says there uh, is that that's my discussion about um, scholasticism, which is based on the notion of logical argument. So it doesn't require, so that if you like, intellectual discussion, which is rational and logical, is a universal way of creating knowledge. So it doesn't need the disciplines. Now, the disciplines might enable us to, to better understand the consequences of our arguments. They may give us more information to make arguments, but the scholastic system for me comes prior to uh, un the um, uh, disciplinary uh, grammatical, the grammar of disciplines. And again, as I mentioned earlier on, Pierce follows that kind of scholastic approach um, in that area. I am moving faster because I want to give you time to change. This is a slide about scholasticism and there's a nice picture. That's probably its greatest advantage. Um, then we've got looking at openness and tolerance. And that's important because I think that we need to look at uh, the ideas of open systems and how open systems allow us um, to develop ourselves in a world um, and, and so open systems allow us to look at the world um, in a fresh way and open systems allow us not to be what others want us to be. Closed systems are much more comfortable. To live in open systems is much more radical and requires us um, to challenge more. Seems to me that's to be a very good reason why we would want uh, students um, to understand the notion of open systems. Uh, and um, closed systems um, seem to me to be disciplinary systems. Um, causal powers, basically I'm saying there, you've got two types of causal power. One which is natural, which is the flower grows, you grow to six foot seven, um, you grow a beard, um, and there are other powers which are um, affected by the externality. I won't linger on external powers, but they just they're critical to my argument because they say they are within us and those those can be um, articulated. They're our potential. They can grow inclusively, in, in exclusively within us, but they are often triggered by ex the externality of our environment. If you want to discuss external powers, we can discuss those later. I want to make an argument here very quickly for imagining not mastering our world. It seems to me that one of the one of the most negative approaches to our world is that we try to master it, which kind of assumes that, as Heidegger would talk about in the um, 
in framing that instead of living with the world, we try to be master of it. And all of you are fully conversant, I'm sure, with all the different uh, connotations that has has. So we should be asking uh, and trying to teach people to imagine new worlds and new uh, um, uh, trans, uh, no transdisciplinary pedagogies, but without having as their goal mastery over the student, mastery over the subject. Because in open systems, I don't know how you can have mastery. You can have competence, you can engage effectively, but you can't master, I think. And this slide talks about um, why we shouldn't master, but we should imagine alternative worlds and alternative places. And that comes back to the uh, synchronic contingency of um, Duns Scotus. So the academic attitude is trying to pull these transdisciplinary issues together. Um, and that's to reveal the importance of the balance of particular singularity and commonality. Now, clearly that doesn't work in a higher education institution, which is driven by cost. OK, so the solution to that is stop that. Seems to me, um, I mean, we don't want to do that, but there are alternatives to it. Um, and it requires facing the paradox of the one in many in teaching and allows diverse, diverse voices. I think a cop out is um, student centred learning because my experience of it, or certainly how I do it, is that it isn't. Um, so the second is to show ways in which capabilities can be actualized. In the, I don't want to talk about this tonight, but happy to come back, is that the discussion of the transcendentals, the transcendentals of seeing the world as beautiful, true and one, seems to me to be, would be the first criteria I would lay down for curriculum development. When you develop a curriculum in anything, its purpose is to enable us to see the world as beautiful, to see it as trustworthy, and to see it as one and uh, a unity of one. And the third is to harness students' desires to realize their capabilities, but without self-deception. I think self-deception and illusion is embedded. I mean, we, there is one person that you might find this difficult to accept as self-delusionary, uh, and that might well, and I'm going to just throw it out there, a certain Boris Johnson. Now, he leads and models for us self-deception and believe and having illusionary ideas of being in the world. And so that, that's our problem as teachers is to, I think, to take that image away from our students. So we need to develop methodological uh, of inquiry. I think uh, the scholastic method offers an opportunity to do that. And we can talk about that. Uh, and why are we doing it? Well, this is my favourite quote um, from Toy Story. I say that because I've only read the confessions because it's much smaller than the other stuff. Um, but of what I've read, he's, this is the, the point that I think is critical. Unless we understand why we're teaching, why are we doing it, it seems to me. Um, and in response to the arrogance of me, it's the role of teaching is to help the will harness the intellect to exist with others, to influence the world for the betterment of whilst maintaining an identity of self-worth. Not self-deception, self-wealth. In transdisciplinary terms, it's the develop abilities of the individual for self-observation, to be self-critical and to confront our imaginary selves with the illusions of who we might be and what we might become. And it's about confronting self-deception. I'm big on self-deception. Sorry, on confronting self-deception. Um, how can we start to begin this? Well, rationality underpins the cultural logic of scholasticism. We need to look at, these aren't bipolars. We need to look at learned and popular culture, how that is important in the way in which um, our world and our teaching is involved. We need to look at the private and public spheres of what we do um, in our teaching. We need to look at moral 
moral and contented lives. There's a great book on contentment. I, modesty prevents me from telling you. Um, and it's about looking at um, polemic and uh, poetry and romanticism in our world. And it's about looking at um, tragedy and comedy. So these are all the, for me, the transcendentals and these are the cornerstones of curriculum development. Uh, and we should put, and I have to tell you at, the, at this point in time, the QAA haven't adopted these. And um, just how do we do it? I don't know. Be, being sensible and related into dealing in our practice. I try to do it in my practice, but I thought if you find anything of interest in what I've said, and I'm not necessarily arguing you should, um, but the, the, those of you who stayed, I'm very grateful. Um, let's have a discussion. Happy to answer anything or engage with you on anything that I've said. Uh, there is a paper. I'd send it to Craig if you want to uh, to look at it, improve it, send it back to me, and I'll take the credit. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. wow. Paul, oh, that, that, that was, was, well, what a collection of kind of powerful and amazing ideas. ideas. Um, um, so it, it's raised a number of questions for me that I want to kind of uh, ask you about. Um, but rather than, uh, I'm going to say rather than abuse my position as, as chair and kind of dive straight in, um, uh, I'll, I'll offer it out first. Is it, you know, anybody, any questions or any areas that you want to pick up on that, that Paul has covered for us tonight? Uh, yeah. Great. Who's that? Excellent. Hi, it's Joe. Hi, hi Joe. Hi, hi. Could you, can um, we see you or? Yeah, sure. Because if you're going to be offensive, I want to look you in the eyes. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully not. Um, potentially very stupid, I suspect. But anyway, um, I'm struggling. I mean, there are all sorts of things that you've said that I'm struggling with, but just one to pick out that came relatively recently in your presentation. I'm struggling with um, reconciling the notion of rationality, which seems to me to be a sort of static um, notion, a notion which suggests that there's a, a right position to take up. And I'm struggling with reconciling that with transdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, um, multiplicity of realities and so on. So I don't know if you could say a little bit more about that or whether I, I, I just, I, I'm, I'm defining rationality in a way that you don't, you don't share and that you've got a, a different sort of concept um, than the one that I carry around with me, which is that, yes, it's the sort of static notion it's a, a a notion associated with the right position to take up yeah i, I very perceptive i was i'd already decided not to answer this question <laughs> the um as i see it rationality doesn't have that end goal it doesn't have the end goal of a, a of the correct answer in the sense of that an answer is f foregrounded. What it is, is a, for me, it's a way of engaging with the, the world that exists. So it's, I think, for instance, if we take folklore or folk knowledge, right? I would argue there's a rationality in folk knowledge, which is worth respecting and developing. Right. So there are rationalities, I think, is, is the uh, approach that I would take. The other right. thing about it is that I think you're right, is that and it, it, it ought not if you take that position, then it isn't an elitist approach. You could argue logisticians are the ones who know all the answers, kind of Plato's um, guardians could do that and the plebs can't. Yeah. What I'm arguing is that 
the um, all of us hold views, even and those views, if they are argued with a certain rationality, can be accepted. They may be countered, but yeah. they, they have a value in and of themselves. Because without that, one of the critical things in transitionality, which is its um, democratic engagement, not democratic in a political sense, uh, sorry, in a formal political sense, but with a small p. Everybody has the right to be heard and to under and be understood. And so if I don't understand your rationality, I have to try to seek to understand that. Right. right. And because I might, or uh, Craig might use Latin, that doesn't give him any priority over somebody standing on the cop swearing. Right, right. Got you. Yeah, uh, it's it's a, it's the way that the notion of rationality is used that I've yeah. imported into um, the the discussion that you've. Yeah. But I think what you say is is for me because I don't want to ask any other questions. That's why I'm going to ask stick on this one. Uh -huh. um, what what you do is show one of the greatest flaws, in my view, in interdisciplinary and. Uh, multidisciplinarity because there right. is an assumed rationality and there's assumed languages and all of those are are kept separate because of the hegemony of the owners of those disciplines right right yeah no that makes very good sense to me thank you yeah thank you excellent thanks um Right, I'm, I'm going to kind of sneak my question in now, if, if that's okay with people. Um, I make it, it, I make it six fifty nine, Craig. So <laughs> forty nine, I make it. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Craig. Anyway, please. anyway, forget about time. <laughs> it's a relative construct, of course. Um, Right, so it, it, you, you've used the term curriculum a couple of times, yeah. which, which interestingly, you know, it, it derives from the term curare, which means to run, uh, which, uh, you know, kind of belies a, a much more kind of liberated approach to what the quite restricted notion of curricula or curriculum has become. So, so with, with that in mind, how, how can we develop a curriculum that recognises and facilitates complexity and openness? Uh, you know, kind of, especially in the types of institutions that, that we work in. OK, if we take the last bit first, I mean, it's. I don't know is the answer, uh, uh, because I don't know you, you know, I mean, I know you. Blah, blah, blah. So <laughs> it's a challenge for us to engage in that. But it would seem to me that when most of us develop, you know, in an institution in the UK, you reach to the standards and our management insists on that. All I'm saying is that, you know, you know when you pick up a piece of music and you play it, mm -hmm. all of us will play the same notes. Well, it, I can't because I can't play it. Either. But you know, well, once, you're, once you can play a piano and you know where the notes are, there's people at grade one and there's the great concert pianists mm -hmm. so you could argue that the standards that are implicit in QAA and other and it's worse in other university other systems are just those notes and so you can play them through transdisciplinary you can play them through Don Scottis's notions of the transcendentals and, and the notion of the formal distinction or you can play them without it. Now, that just seems to me to be a realist way of taking that forward. Now, the risks to you may be huge. But I'm also saying, you know, in a kind of Nietzscheian Superman, super person um, situation, that if you are going to be free, then you take those, those risks. Mm -hmm. And so it does require... I, and and that and if you could do that, then I believe you are worthy of um, academic freedom, and you are a parahesia, and so that seems to me where we should go. Now you can argue all that is ideal, 
and clearly it is ideal from somebody who's retired. <laughs> I see the irony in that. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that I still feel that that's things that we can do if we believe it. Um, what you do see across the, the world in transdisciplinary curriculum, it's basically problem solving curriculum. So they don't do what I'm talking about. What they talk about is saying, well, um, let's have um, we we'll have problem solving and we'll talk about participatory action research. So it, it doesn't dig deep enough and, and, and let the notions of transitory emerge from the context would be the way I would argue. But that's how I would treat um, uh, how you or me could develop a curriculum. And it allows you to hide behind standards and um, learning outcomes. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I I agree with you entirely. Um, you know, it's interesting that you you know part easier to you know, the, you know speaking truth to power. Um, absolutely, I, I think there's always kind of spaces and opportunities to even no matter you know with, with all the the constraints that we have to work in, I still think that there are spaces for tactics uh, and looking at doing things differently. Um, you know, because because standards an interesting term in itself. You know, it, it's a, a kind of military term from stand hard. You know, to to keep the standard in the same place, to keep it. Um, you know, but it's about conformity and and, and keeping things the same. Um, uh, so I, I think all of those things absolutely should be resisted and um, and challenged. Yeah. So, yeah. It comes back to my perspective. Even Nicolescu doesn't talk about realities being in flux. Yeah, and, and being um, and, and so I, I think once you get there, the whole thing is moving um, and it confronts. It's very radical if you want to take it on, mm -hmm. you know, because why are you a professor? You know, and I, I'm an associate professor or professor or, or whatever, apart from yeah. the money, um, <laughs> it kind of just closes you in. Yeah, yeah. And that's why we're better in the UK. You know, I'm not going to be naked completely, you know. In, if those of you who've experienced it teaching abroad, if your doctorate isn't in the subject you're going to teach, so if 50 years ago you did horticulture, you're stuck in the garden. Yeah, you can't do metaphysics because I'll teach it at university, even if you've written buckets of papers on that. That's not this country. It's my experience, particularly in um, uh, community colleges in America, and it's just particularly in post-Soviet economies. Mm -hmm. So they have an even greater difficulty. You know? yeah. So it's been changing the whole, that's why I think it's a metaphysics as distinct from uh, an ontology or a, um, or a simple ontology or a epistemological um, approach. Anyway, that's that's that. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that's a great response. Thanks. Um, right. Any uh, any other questions? Anybody want to ask about or clarify or Good. seek enlightenment? <laughs> Somebody's put their hand up. Whoa! Uh, 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 let me see. Let me see. That's that's uh, me. Amir. Amir. Yeah, that's yeah. The, Paul. For first of all, let's thank you. I shall say if I. Uh, I was in Japanese lesson. I, I I probably understood something. So, but but I still I dare to to ask a question anyway because it 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 was in my field. But I enjoy anyway. So it's kind of because you 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 kind of uh, said a sentence. I want to check with you. You said rigor doesn't need a subject or discipline, something like that. So could you say again? I. You said rigor doesn't need a discipline or a subject. You you, you said something. Yeah, I, I think. What I was meaning is that you, rigor doesn't have to be realized through the grammar of a discipline or a subject. Can you, you know, I ask that because I am my, my background in mathematics education and rigor has a, a specific purpose. Yes. But then actually I, what I understood from what you said is seems that actually rigor can be more than 
what we use there. It's kind of as a more general notion to it. I think I would argue that the mathematics use of rigor has clear value, but for me, it is a form of rigor, not the rigor. In the same way as my my friend on watching Liverpool, analysis of the football can be rigorous, but it may not conform to the same constraints on rigor that you might in mathematics. Using that. To be honest, I, I'm going to use that notion in, in a positive way because I'm thinking of can can, for example, my student be rigorous in a sense that you're you're using even in math class, but not yet mathematically rigorous. It is the thing that I'm thinking of. I think that would work. Yes. And I'm sorry, I'm not. I don't mean to be. I, I'm, I mean, it sounds a a, a good way of approaching. Um, any subject. So people can be rigorous in a multifaceted way. And then if you need to, because of the one, uh, just caveat, transdisciplinarity isn't, it isn't anti-disciplines, it's different from disciplines. So you can settle mathematics or physics or chemistry or English in transdisciplinarity. It's the same way as you can settle, perhaps, Newton physics in Einstein, uh, Einstein Estonian physics. Okay, thank you, thank you. Actually, that that was a few uh, useful Japanese term that I get, but I'm going to use. Thank, thank you. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it is. I think it is interesting that you know the the kind of etymology of, of rigor is is stiffness, you know, and the kind of connotations with discipline, uh, you know, to be disciplined, uh, you know. So, so I think there's a there's a there's a, a certain symmetry with these terms, and in, in, in that they can be effectively counterbalanced against the notion of complexity, imagination, creativity, and and certainly open systems. Um, yeah, and it opens right. up a gap, doesn't it? Yeah, but, yeah. Which, which I, which tends to get filled with the stuff that's inappropriate for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, I'm, I'm just, just looking at the, the, the time. We're, we're at eighteen fifty nine. Um, so, um, I have a lot of Hina, I was going to say, uh, any final questions, and then uh, a hand showed for uh, Hina. So, uh, fire away, ask your question. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much. I think as a student, I loved listening to you today, Paul. Uh, I feel a bit intimidated as <laughs> asking you this, but uh, then I thought uh, that you touched uh, on a lot of things, uh, especially ownership, authenticity, and having uh, a more more democratic education and encourage educators to be more, uh, to create a more uh, engaging curriculum and i wanted to ask uh, uh, uh say something on that and as uh i know there are a lot of educators who uh, lecturers who design their curriculum um in a certain way and especially i'm touching on assignments here i thought if uh, uh students were given more autonomy from that point at that side um uh, especially uh, by working with the examining body and giving students more autonomy on how they would like to design and submit their assignments would then uh, let them be more authentic and uh, let them have more ownership over their own education. Because uh, I've been doing a, a lot of research on discovery learning and hutagogy uh, right now. And I feel that that is uh, honestly the, the way forward, if I, if I may say uh, so. Uh, so that was it. Sorry. Hinda, I think you have a really good point. I used to work at an institution which we did work based learning. Yeah. And the whole point of that was that you would take people who had uh, non um, framed academic skills yeah. and you would look at their work and give them accreditation for prior learning. But what they had to do was to take these skills, which were quite evidently of high quality, and convert them into academic jargon to get a credit. 
And it seemed to me that was always the wrong way round. And that the academic's job was to take the skills of that person who, who was presenting those skills and knowledge and then to, and the academic's job was the translator's responsibility. They had to translate it into academic uh, assessment criteria and that kind of thing. So I do think you're absolutely right. It will radically change the ways in which students and universities in, uh, engage with each other, and it would be much more intense. But what we could do is cut out some of the stuff that we teach to make room for this. And that would kind of probably be more, and it, on the basis that most of the stuff that we teach undergraduates and teach on masters is worn out within a number of years. Yeah. If we talked about people, people how to construct their own assessments so as not to be self-deceiving, that would be a better one. And then of course, if we got the students to mark them as well, we could just take our money and not turn up. <laughs> okay. But so no more, no more progressive education then. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you though. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks. Thanks for that. Right, we're, we're now uh, at three minutes past. Um, so the, the, the hour is up. Uh, so I just want to take this opportunity to, to thank Paul for the fascinating presentation um, and, you know, so for kind of pausing those provoking ideas uh, and generating those questions uh, and for kind of explaining and fielding the questions so effectively as well. Um, so thank you very much. Much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody, so guys, anybody wants to continue the discussion? Not now, because I've got a beer waiting. But... Um, <laughs> I would be really happy to have that discussion and, and extend it. And again, if you want the paper and want you to comment on it um, or just want to work with me or anything like that, I'll be, it'll be a great pleasure to participate with your, your stuff. So take really good care. I, I think just, just on that, Paul, what, what, because we're, we're kind of making gradual inroads into you know, what we might term as normality. Uh, so what we could maybe look at later in the year is, um, you know, can kind of maybe invite you up for a, a kind of af an afternoon uh, seminar session at JMU, and um, if, if you're up for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll look at that as an option. Yeah, so if you pay, sorry, you didn't mention that. <laughs> well, well, I'll pay for beer. <laughs> so I, well, you better give me four days' notice so I can walk up then. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course, we, we yeah, yeah. Anyway, so, so absolutely, yeah, fabulous. Many thanks, much appreciated. Well uh, and thanks everybody for the, the support and turning yeah. up. So I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Take care. Cheers. Bye bye. Thank you.